Good evening. Uh, my name is Tim Conklin. I'm with the Northwest Arkansas Regional Planning Commission. Um, this is a lecture, first lecture in a four-part series that will explore the topic of growing mobility for our growing region. Um, the four-part series is made possible through a grant from the Walton Family Foundation. I would like to thank the foundation for their support of this series and all of their past and continued support for all of the home region initiatives, programs, and projects that have improved the quality of life for everyone living in the region. And so many of you uh, in the jurisdictions and people in the audience tonight have benefited with their generous support of funding programs uh, from trails, mountain biking, uh, art centers. Uh, once again, very appreciative of the Walton Family Foundation. Our region continues to grow at a very rapid pace. By 2040, the population is forecasted to grow by another 300,000 people. So when you think about Northwest Arkansas, just 25 years ago, we built a whole nother Northwest Arkansas in the last 25 years. We are gonna add almost another entire Northwest Arkansas in the next uh, 25 years. One thing that is unique to our region is that there is not just one unit of government or agency that is solely responsible for planning a complete, connected, safe, and I'll stress, low stress uh, transportation system or in the systems that we all utilize every day. Uh, we continue to work together, all 32 cities and the two counties in Northwest Arkansas uh, to improve and grow mobility in the region. All of us are planning partners, and we use that term a lot uh, in Northwest Arkansas, uh, from the cities, transit agencies, counties, and the state DOT will continue to need to plan, program, build, operate, and maintain uh, not just the current systems that we have today that provides mobility for us in Northwest Arkansas, but for future systems that provide mobility for future generations. The Regional Planning Commission had the opportunity to provide copies of Mr. Walker's book, Human Transit, How Clearer Thinking About Public Transit Can Enrich Our Communities and Our Lives to Every Planning Commissioner an elected official in cities with fixed route transit several weeks ago. Uh, we wanted to make sure uh, those in leadership positions had an opportunity uh, not only to hear from uh, uh, Mr. Walker this evening, but participate in his lecture. Uh, each day, each week, each month, and each year, our municipalities approve numerous development proposals and implement major infrastructure projects. Each of these decisions that we make on a daily, weekly, monthly, and yearly basis impacts individuals' ability to access the area's transportation modes by walking, biking, transit, and car. So it's critical that we all work together to try to plan transit without the other modes of transportation like sidewalks is very difficult in a fast-growing region. Over the next 10 months, this four-part series will explore the topic of how together we can grow mobility for a region as we learn from national experts in peer communities. So I hope uh, you not uh, only attend this first event, but attend the next three events, which will help uh, explore this topic of how we all can work together to improve mobility in all modes. Uh, for those who are seeking continuing education credits, we have received approval through the American Institute of Certified Planners, uh, the American Institute of Architects. There may be credits pending through the American Society of Landscape Architects and uh, credits through the American Society of Civil Engineers. We'll continue to try to make sure that the professional organizations that credits are uh, applied for and available for those in attendance. I would now like to introduce Mr. Jarrett Walker. Mr. Jarrett Walker, PhD, is an international consultant in public transit network design and policy. With 25 years experience planning public transit in North America, Europe, Russia, Australia, and New Zealand, his firm, Jarrett Walker and Associates, 
based in Portland, Oregon, provides transit planning and executive advice to clients worldwide. Some of you may recognize Mr. Walker from the uh, delegation that was sent to the Congress for New Urbanism last spring in Seattle. Uh, his book, Human Transit, was published by Island Press in 2011. The book offers an introduction to transit issues for the average reader designed to help anyone form clearer views that reflect their own values. In addition to his consulting, teaching, and speaking, he writes about public transit issues at humantransit.org. Mr. Walker is practically interested in an impractical number of fields. He is probably the only person with peer-reviewed articles in both the Journal of Transport Geography and Shakespeare Quarterly. So without further ado, <laughs> Mr. Jarrett Walker. Thanks very much, Tim, and uh, I appreciate the, everything Tim's done to smooth out this visit, and of course, thanks to the Walton Family Foundation for making this possible. <coughs> um, I'm gonna talk for maybe half an hour or so, lay out some ideas for you, try to give you all something to argue with, and um, maybe approach this, conver this conversation from a different way, and then I hope we'll have time to have questions. So um, as Tim mentioned, growth is coming at you. This is pretty astonishing growth rate um, that's, that's coming at you in this county. And the first thing we all have to remember about this growth rate is that it means there is no status quo. It means that if you are against transit, it doesn't mean that you can keep everything the way it is. <laughs> because there is no keeping things the way, the way they are. Things are changing very rapidly in ways that are going to affect everyone who lives here. And so the question is more, how do we manage what's coming at us? How do you choose to manage that growth? Um, and one of the things I would like you to, to remember about this presentation is that please don't believe anything I say because I'm an expert. Believe me, because I'm making sense. And one of the basic kinds of sense that I always try to make is to mark very clearly how much of what we know about transit, how much of what we know about urban transportation, we know geometrically. We know it the way we know the value of pi. We know it the same way we know that we can't fit an elephant into a wine glass, and we're so sure of that that we don't even need to do the experiment. That's because that's geometric knowledge. Right? Knowledge about space, knowledge about, how, about physical space. And that's a lot of what we know about transportation, a lot of what keeps pushing us back toward transit as a solution is thinking geometrically, not getting... In, so one of the things you'll notice in this presentation, I won't throw a lot of data at you. I won't throw a lot of statistics at you because statistics are easy to argue with, but geometry isn't. Um, so this is a famous drawing about... Um, one of the major arguments for transit and for bicycles and for other kinds of non-car modes, which is about how much space 100 people take, depending on which of those modes they're using. This is a great example of a purely geometric explanation, right? You don't need any more data after you've seen this. Now, obviously, this picture is taken in a relatively dense city where there are a lot of people trying to travel, and therefore the amount of, of space they take matters. Um, some of y'all may feel that you have severe traffic congestion here. Most of us who live in bigger cities would say that you probably don't, but you will. Part of growing bigger is that all of this will get worse if you choose to continue to have an overwhelmingly car-dependent urban form. Sooner or later, you, as you grow, you will run into the problem of how much space cars take. And here's the problem. If you wait until that problem is evident to everyone, it will be too late to solve it. Or at least it will be too late to solve it without truly catastrophic expense. This is where Los Angeles is. So Los Angeles was, uh, Los Angeles was built and conceived and developed with the, around the basic notion that there's so much space here. And we can all spread out and we can have our nice little towns. And there was a period, of course, when the towns were connected by streetcars. But then, you know, as the streetcars went away in the 20th century, there was just a sense of so much space and we could spread out and we could drive our cars everywhere. 
And of course, that's what will, that's, we've had a wonderful, we're having a wonderful life. Of course, we want this same life for our children and for our grandchildren. Well, now, your, grand, your, your grandchildren are not pretty happy with you, and some of them may be cursing your memory because Los Angeles now has an overwhelming consensus that the entire way the city was built is a mistake. The there's an overwhelming consensus in LA manifested, for example, in colossal margins that voters are giving to measures that massively raise taxes, enormous funding measures, to, to desperately try to retrofit some kind of rapid transit system and some kind of broad transit system to this city as, it, as their grandparents built it. 70%, yes, on huge funding measures. Um, that, that, you know, we just had another one last November because they, everyone in LA understands that they live in a place that doesn't work as it was designed and it needs to be completely rethought and that the only way that this many people can live in that space, which suddenly does not feel like very spacious at all, is with a way of getting around that doesn't take so much space. Because ultimately that will always be the, the, the one argument about transit that nobody can really argue with, which is that it moves so many people in so little space. Now, I'm not gonna spend too long on this, but all of us are reading lots of technology news. And lots of companies are out there saying, we're disrupting this and that, and everything's about to be different. Throw away everything you think you know. And I'm here to say, don't throw away everything you think you know, because although the people who want to sell us things want, to, want us to sort of mix everything up and get excited about how all different things combine, and above all about what the future will be like, what we really need is to keep a clear head about all these innovations and, and understand that they are different solutions to different problems. There is a problem of the emissions and of the efficient use of energy for which the dominant solution is going to be electrification. There is a separate and unrelated problem of the efficient use of labor and also of safety for which the solution is probably going to be autonomous vehicles. And then there is a third, completely unrelated problem of the efficient use of space in cities. A city is a place where there are many people living close together. Mathematically, that's the same as saying a city is a place without much space per person, which means it's a place where space is precious. And the answer to that is going to be big vehicles, vehicles that can move lots of people in not much space. Now again, you may not feel like you're a city here, but the growth projections say that you're becoming, you know, becoming more and more urban in one way or another, and you as a community get to decide what that's going to look like. And if you, want, if you decide you want to be denser, if you decide you want more stuff like this around us in downtown Bentonville, then you're going to need more transit for this simple geometric reason. But now, we, st we get past that point, and we start arguing about one, what kind of transit, and now the argument gets very confused and frayed. People are bringing all kinds of different notions to it. You know, there's, you know is, is it sort of for the poor? Is it something that needs to be um, sexy and exciting? Um, what is it exactly? Oh, we have a rail corridor. Maybe we should do trains. There's all sorts of ideas about that. And rather than, pr pr than pick a particular idea, what, what I, what I want to suggest is a possible different way of thinking about the goal. And that's the idea of the wall around your life. So the idea here is that all of us, no matter how free we feel, are in prison to some degree. And the walls of our prison are where we could get to in a reasonable amount of time. This, for example, is a map based on my hometown, Portland, Oregon, and it shows that if I located in downtown Portland, this is where I could get to on transit plus walking in 15, 30, or 45 minutes. Those are the three concentric blobs. And so if something isn't in those blobs, it's not available to me in my life, right? I can't, you know, if you live at the point or in the middle, then the places outside those blobs are jobs you can't hold, schools you can't go to, people you will never meet in person. Who knows, maybe that will determine who you will marry. There's only so much of that that you can do on the internet. Sooner or later, you have to be physically accessible. And so when I talk about this, I'm talking about something that's fairly fundamental, 
I'm not talking about transportation anymore. I'm talking about freedom. I'm talking about your ability to go places and therefore do things. Transportation isn't the point. The point is the thing you get to do when you get there. And to focus on the fact that what transportation planning is doing, what is at stake in that, is ultimately governing how far out the walls of your prison will be. In other words, how much liberty and opportunity you will have as a citizen of a city or of an urban area. So the one cool thing about this tool is that I can move it, my pointer around and start to take responsibility for the consequences of my own location choice. This is a very important thing for anyone who's locating anything. Um, so for example, recently I was looking for a new office space for my company and I could have located in downtown Portland and that's where employees could have gotten to me from. Or I could have located in a sort of hipster di inner city district and that's where they could have gotten to me from. Or I could have found something in a, business, in a suburban business park and that's where they could have gotten to me from. And I got to choose that outcome when I chose my location. It is not necessarily the transit agency's responsibility to come rescue me from wherever I have chosen to locate if I have chosen to locate in a place where transit isn't practical, and we'll talk more about that. But more importantly, it comes back to the question, what if, we, what, if what we were doing in transportation planning was just trying to make these blobs bigger? What if, in other words, we wanted more people to be able to get to more places so that they can do more things or so that their life presents them with more choices? Because it's the reality of meaningful choices that makes us free, right? If you can only get to one grocery store, then you're not really in the position to make any choices as a customer, right? You gotta go to that grocery store. Likewise, with everything, what we want people to have choices and that's one of the things that this captures. So this is really a measurement of everything we as Americans mean by freedom as it manifests in a physical dimension, right? So there are some freedoms that are important to us Americans that we can now exercise online, you know, freedom of speech and so on. But there is still, as you think through the basic dimensions of freedom as Americans value it, a lot of it still comes down to, to freedoms that require going places if only so that we can physically show up for one another. Freedom of assembly, for example. The idea that we can physically show up for one another, be in the same place, and therefore create something that we can't do at home, that we can't even do at home online. So when I'm asking the question, you know, um, when I'm asking the question is blogs, I'm asking essentially how much of the city and all its richness is available to me as a citizen, which is to say, how free am I? Now the interest, so, so these images are something that my firm now uses whenever we're redesigning or redesigning a transit network. So we're going through and you know, we lay out some ideas for a transit network. Uh, Joy, Gold, uh, Joy Reed, sorry, from my staff and I were just doing this in Phil for Philadelphia. We were going through laying out routes a particular way. Then we started looking at these blobs, isochrones is the, is the fancy word for them. Um, um, oh, there's a problem there, how do we fix that? How do we make this so that as many people as possible feel the walls of their prison moving outward, feel the opportunities of their lives increasing? Now one of the cool things about that is that the way you get from a network to facts about where people can go is entirely geometric. I don't need social science, I don't need psychology, I don't need history, I don't need anybody's generalizations about culture, that where you can go, your freedom is a geometric fact arising from facts about the transportation network. This is actually very powerful because although we all deep down want this to be about our personal identity and culture and special needs, it's, exhaust, it's impossible to get anywhere if you're, think, if you're hearing only about everybody's personality and culture and, and, and special needs. We've got to take this to a level that we share, and what we share is the reality of physical space and the reality of the facts about how different kinds of transportation investment and different kinds of transit investment make where we can get to bigger or smaller. Now, of course, most discussion about investment doesn't stop here. It wants to talk about ridership. It wants to talk about who's going to use this thing. And the answer is that's a prediction. And predictions are a completely different kind of thing. 
Because freedom is the freedom to surprise. Freedom is the freedom to do what was not predicted. If all you do is what a model predicted, you weren't really very free, were you? You just did what the model expected you to do. Now, this is actually a very deep philosophical issue. In philosophy, you'll hear about the debate between free will, are we actually objectively free in our choices, and determinism, which is the notion that everything is just a giant machine and we're just part of it and we're just doing what we were fated to do. And that's really what's at issue here. And the point is to notice the, the tension, notice the contradiction between our desire to be free ourselves and our desire to predict the behavior of other people, right? Um, you can't have both of those things, really, can you? Because if you're going to be unpredictable, then they get to be unpredictable too. This is interesting to think about intergenerationally because sometimes when I'm talking to groups of young people, I will point out that our predictive models, the tools we use to predict the future, to predict in particular what will happen in response to a, predict, to a certain thing we're proposing, like a new transit network or a new transit line, they have to assume that in the background, all kinds of other things will stay the same. They have to assume that all kinds of other things are not changing. When I'm talking to younger people, I'll sometimes say, if we go out 20 years with this kind of prediction, it's the equivalent of saying, 20 years, that's a generation. It's the equivalent of saying, when you're the same age as your parents are now, we predict that you will behave exactly the way they do. Right? We are fundamentally cutting off the possibility that our children will actually surprise us. <laughs> and will actually surprise us in ways that make the world better or certainly make the world different. It's actually not a very reliable basis for prediction. Everybody in the prediction business knows this. There's no other basis for prediction, so it's what we have to assume. But that's very different from actually believing too much in the outcome of the prediction. The cool thing about freedom is I don't have to do any of that. I don't need psychology. I don't need history. I don't need social science. I don't need really data. All I need is this is the network and this is what it means about what people can do. So does freedom matter more than prediction? Would you rather feel freer yourself and give up in return the need to feel like you can predict the behavior of others? So what does this mean for transit? If I'm just trying to grow these blobs, if I just want more people to be able to get to more places, what do I actually do in the design of a transit system? Those are the key pieces, and I'm going to talk through them. High, day fre high frequency, forming a connected network with reasonable speed and reliability, following patterns of density, walkability, and linearity. Now, one of the things I want you to notice right away is that although speed and reliability are on there, they aren't actually the number one priority. If you watch how different kinds of transit designs affect those blobs, you discover very quickly that frequency is actually predominant. And that if you don't have high frequency service, forget about the rest. Start with that. Because speed, uh, you know, very frequently the actual total travel time of a transit trip is dominated by the waiting time, is dominated by the, in short, by the effects of frequency. So let's start with that. Frequency is a cubed value. By cubed, I mean it does three mathematically independent cool things. Um, it means less time spent where you don't want to be. We used to call that waiting, but of course we have lots of information now. We don't necessarily stand at the stop, but there's still time spent not where we want to be, right? If your bus comes once an hour and, and you have to be at work at 8 o'clock and the bus gets there at 7.02 or 8.02, you're going to have to get to work 58 minutes early. Time, you know, it's time spent not where you want to be. It means easier connections to reach more destinations quickly. And I want to applaud Joel Gardner and, and Ozai sorry, Transit for doing what they can to make hourly buses connect with one another. But it's a very delicate business, making that happen with schedules. And the real way that connections become easy, the real way that routes start to fit together to form a network that enable you to go lots of places, is just frequency, which means that the connecting service is coming. And it means better recovery from disruption, bus breaks down, and others along soon. In bigger cities, and you'll encounter this pretty soon, we'll observe that frequency is a key to affordability. That when we are trying to figure out how to, uh, you know, how to provide, make sure we have lots of options for lower income people to choose to rely on transit, the key thing is there need to be places on good transit that they can afford to live, which may not be right here. 
right? We can get good transit to right here. It's a nice, dense, walkable place. But a lot of lower income people probably can't afford to live right here. They're going to have to live out there. We, and and giving, providing some signals to the market about what are good places for low income people to live where they can get to decent transit is an important thing, and frequent networks do that. You'll reach a point, too, where frequency supports lower parking requirements for dense development. And when, we get, when you get to that point, Fayetteville's probably there, where you notice that, you can, that you're getting so much, you have so much potential for travel by transit and by other modes that you don't need as much parking per unit, that the usual ratios you use in development can start to turn down. That's where you get a real positive feedback effect when you're trying to build a denser city. But frequency is hard to explain. I have to pound the table about it because people who get around by car don't have an analogy to it. It's very easy when I have a group of people around by, uh, who get around by car and who are kind of theoretically interested in transit. It's very easy to get them talking about speed and reliability, and I think that's because that's a motorist concept that transfers very easily over to transit. Motorists have a concept of speed and reliability, but there isn't a motorist concept of frequency. The closest thing you have is traffic signals. Well, when, uh, tra waiting for traffic signals, waiting for elevators. Those are minute waits compared to the kind of delay that's involved with low frequency transit service. And if you want to understand why your transit ser services aren't performing better than they are, the extreme limitation caused by the fact that most of them are coming only once an hour is, is an easy part of the answer. I mean, outside of Razorback. Razorback is more frequent. So sometimes when I'm trying to explain this to a motorist, I will have to say things like, imagine there's a gate at the end of your driveway that only opens once an hour on the hour. That's your problem. Okay, so maybe more important than making the roads factor, faster is to figure out how to get this gate to open more often because that, the gate is actually constraining your travel times, limiting your life, bringing the walls inward much more than the speed of anything is. That's really the reality for transit. You start with frequency. So then where, again, this is pure geometry. I'm now going to start talking about why some neighborhoods are just better for transit than others, and people are going to be, in, are, are going to be tempted to hear, oh, so you don't like my neighborhood, huh? And, I'm not gonna, I'm not, and, and we all need to be able to talk like this, because this is a brute geometric fact, and it's not about whether you're good people, it's just about some geometric facts about where you live or where you work or where you've chosen to locate. So density, those two bus routes have the same cost to operate because they each have the same number of buses on them, but the one on the top has twice as many people and jobs within walking distance of every stop, so its total potential market is double, so of course it has higher ridership. If it didn't, you'd have to have a theory for why people in that neighborhood use transit less than individual people at lower density, but it's the opposite. Higher density places, generate more ridership because there are more people. And then in addition, the people in those places are more likely to use transit because there are other disincentives to driving that arise from being at high density. So in fact, we usually get more than double the ridership. That's why high ridership service focuses on dense places. Walkability. So there on the left, that dot in the middle of that circle is a transit stop, and the circle is a quarter mile radius around it. Um, well. It's great if you're within a quarter mile of a stop, but only if you can actually walk to the stop in a quarter mile. So cities that have continuous, dense, gridded street networks, like we have around us here, do very well, because on those gridded networks, most of the area in the circle can actually walk to the stop in that distance. But if your local street network looks like one on the bottom, it's not that you're bad people, but that kind of street network has walled off large parts of the area and taken it outside of a quarter mile walk from the stop. So again, smaller market, lower ridership potential. We don't have to talk about psychology, we don't have to talk about demographics, it's just the brute fact of who can get to the stop. The other important thing about walkability is that you must be able to cross the street at the stop. Because the way transit works is that it will almost always take you from this side of the street and bring you back to that side, and if you can't cross the street at that point, you have one-way service. So. When we start thinking, you know, I'm, I've heard the, the, you know, the ideas about BRT on 71 business, and I've driven a little bit of 71 business, and I'm, I, I have a sense of what it looks like, and it has very long stretches without a safe place to cross. Down here in southern Bentonville, there's a whole strip of hotels, all kinds of lower wage jobs in that strip where there is no safe place to cross the street for, I think, almost a mile. So that's one of your barriers. 
because all you can give to those places is one-way service, a stop only on their side, but with no hope of reaching the stop on the other side. So again, as a transit planner, I say, yeah, tall buildings. I'm sure there are lots of people who'd, need tra who'd, who'd value transit there, but we can't do anything with this street. So lower, you know, lower ridership potential because, again, so many of the potential riders are just cut off by the lack of safe street crossings. Just geometry, remember? I'm not judging anyone. Linearity, transit wants to run in straight lines. For a transit line to be useful, it needs to go pa past places and onward to other places such that everyone on the line finds it to be a reasonably direct path between two points. So there are two different ways that you could arrange a city of, made of the same four land uses. In the one on the top, I can run a single line through all of them, and so everything, and so that means I can maximize frequency, right? The fewest line miles I have to run, the more frequency I can afford. And so I can connect all of those places very effectively such that, such that travel between any two of them will, will be reasonable. If you build it down like the one down below, we can't do that, okay? The, res, the, you know, the business park that is sort of out on a cul-de-sac somewhere, the, with no offense, offense to our sponsors, the Walmart, I'm sorry, uh, Target, that's a quarter mile from the street behind a vast amount of parking, where you, and, and often nowhere near a street crossing. Um, you know, the little college on the hill and so on. All of those choices are, are pushing transit away. And so, of course, as a transit planner, if you want me to pursue ridership, I'm gonna send less service to those places. So, there's no getting around that geometry, right? That's just, that's just brute facts of different kinds of development patterns either help people gather to transit or impede people from gathering to transit. And that's gonna determine ridership outcomes. Some of those things can be fixed, like you can go through and put in more signals on the 71 business. Other things, like local street networks, are pretty immutable and we just have to work with those realities. And people need to understand the reality of where they're choosing to locate and what that means. So now, I've been talking as though, I were, as though the goal were ridership. I've been talking about sort of what do we do to design high ridership transit? And the answer is we run high frequency service to places that look like that and connecting them. But there remains the larger question of do you even want ridership? You pick up the, you look in the media all the time and, you'll, and I'll see articles judging transit agencies based on their ridership. Oh, ridership is trending down. It must be some ominous thing for transit. Is, tra is ridership even what you want? Because I can tell you, I have never ever, in 25 years in this business, I have never worked for a transit agency that actually wanted me to maximize their ridership. That is not ever what I have been told to do. Because there is a competing goal which, we, which I call coverage. And let's understand, again, the pure geometry of it. So this is a fictional area. This is a fictional city where the dots represent people and jobs. So that in this city, there's high density along two major streets and not much density elsewhere. And the two major streets are straight and a lot of the other streets are kind of curving. But there are people scattered everywhere too. And suppose I have 18 buses to deploy a network here. If my goal were ridership, I would put all those buses on the two major streets. Buses close together, which means high frequency, concentrated in the places that are dense and walkable and linear. Everything favorable in terms of the built environment and, their, and the highest frequency, the highest frequency achieved by running the fewest possible route miles, running only there. Remember, the payoffs of density are, a little, are, are, are exponential and so are the payoffs of frequency, as it turns out. So it makes sense to concentrate to get that exponential payoff. It doesn't make sense to spread it out. Now, a couple of times early in my career, I would, I, I would come to work for some, tra I, I would you know, be hired by some transit agency and I'd ask them, okay, what's your goal for this network? And they'd say, ridership, ridership, ridership. And I'd draw them that. And they would say, but what about Mrs. Jones? And I would say, you didn't ask about, you, your criteria didn't ask about Mrs. Jones. Your criteria said you wanted ridership. This is what you'd do if you wanted ridership. Mrs. Jones, who lives in the southeast corner of this city, is not going to like this alternative, but that's not what it's trying to do. It's trying to maximize ridership. So, you mean there's actually something else you want? Yes, there is. So there's this reason we don't design service for ridership, and that's the desire for coverage. And coverage means get a little bit of service to everyone because everyone matters. 
And so if you tell me to design a network for coverage, I'll take those same 18 buses, I'll have 10 bus routes instead of two. As a result, the buses won't come every 15 minutes, they'll come every 75 minutes. And as a result, almost nobody will ride them because a bus coming every 75 minutes isn't very useful, right? So Mrs. Jones gets a bus going past her house eventually, but no one finds the system useful for any but the most extreme lifeline kind of needs because it is so incredibly infrequent. The bus is simply never coming, coming when you need it. So these are, those two cartoons are illustrations of what it would mean to design a network truly for a goal of ridership as opposed to design for a goal of coverage. So the, what you have by and large in this uh, region is a coverage network. Not dense, not walkable, and certainly not linear. Um, it's the sort of bus, it's the sort of, of, of transit service that your transit agency working with the cities has tended to end up with because by and large what the city governments have been telling Ozark Transit is we want coverage, whether or not they've used those words. And so that's what you get. Um, you know, eventually in the course of an hour, if you're willing to ride through three different overlapping loops, you may get to where you're going. The low ridership of this network should not surprise you. Ridership is not its purpose. It's that simple. So it, lies, it, so it ends up line, lining up like this, and the different goals pe bring to, people bring to transit tend to, tend to push in one direction or the other. So for example, if people want us to think like a business, well, what businesses do is choose which markets they will enter. B businesses do not feel obligated to provide their service where there is not enough of a market. So that leads you toward the ridership goal, doesn't it? Um, you're also, but then all of the green benefits of transit, all the environmental benefits of transit, and the congestion be benefits of transit arise from transit being ridden, not just from transit existing. An exist an empty bu a truly empty bus is doing nothing for the environment, and it's doing nothing to mitigate congestion. On the other hand, it's very hard to argue against the notion of access for all. Elected officials tend to say very quickly and easily that of course everyone should be in included, although in transit that means spend most of your budget getting to the 1% who are hardest to reach. That's actually an extremely, um, a, a very radical thing to say about transit, that it ought to get to everyone when you think about how the math of transit works. Um, Obviously, the ridership goal tends to be supportive of the development of places like this around us, dense and walkable places. The coverage goal, by virtue of spreading it out, gets more lifelines to lower, to lower density suburban areas. Lifeline access is an important argument for coverage. You know, there are a few people with needs everywhere. Coverage fundamentally is about intensity of need or intensity of entitlement. Both of which are very powerful arguments because the entitlement side, of course, service to every neighborhood, service to every incorporated city, spread it out politically, service to every council district, whatever the political geography is, spread it out across the political geography so that enough elected officials sitting on their particular geographic patch will find something in it for them. One of the cautions I make about that is that people who are thinking about the transit system in terms of what's in their patch miss the fact that this is not like libraries and fire stations. City councils are used to having conversations about things like libraries and fire stations and, oh, okay, it's in your district. I got one in my district, that's for my people. But a bus running around inside of your council district is not of much use to anyone, right? Everybody, your, everybody else's network is your network and your no, network is everybody else's network because transit is all, a, transportation is all about crossing boundaries. Transportation is transgressive. Transportation is not going to stay inside of your little patch, whatever patch as an elected official you feel you represent. And it can be surprisingly hard to get over that. So the point is, all of the goals on this slide are admirable goals. And there are all sorts of excellent reasons to be on both sides, uh, to be on both sides of this, but they take us in opposite directions. They take us to opposite kinds of network. And so, one of the things I often do when I'm working with communities is I, I'll take them through this process and I'll say, okay, we'll do some exercises that help people discover this problem for themselves if they haven't followed it from the explanation of the geometry. And then I'll say, okay, where do you want to be on this spectrum? Come up with a percentage. Like what percentage of your service
do you want to devote to a ridership goal, which will tend to mean high frequency service concentrated where demand is high? What percent do you want to devote to a coverage goal? We can spread that out. Something that gives the transit agency a clear direction about what their goal should be. Because one of the basic realities of the transit industry right now is that transit managers are like a taxi driver who's being told to turn left and right at the same time. And when he can't turn left and right at the same time, the customer just yells at him louder. That's kind of what it's like to be a transit manager because these goals are simply opposite and everybody wants both of them. And in that situation, we have, I, I, I have to basically work with people and help them figure out where on the spectrum they want to be. It's a, it's a simple numerical thing. You know, for, so for example, when we did the huge redesign of Houston, I came to them, I said, look, one of the reasons your ridership is so low is only about 55% of your service is trying to capture ridership. Only 55% is where it would be if your goal were ridership. Oh, okay. So I said, how long far would you like to turn the dial toward ridership? And they said, yes. How far? And I said, here's how this works, guys. You can turn the dial toward ridership, and as you do, Service gets better in dense corridors, and lots of people in outer fringes in cul-de-sacs lose their service, and they come and scream at you. And beautiful people will stand in front of you at this podium in your, in your board hall, and they will tell you that you are destroying their lives. And you will have to sit through that. So, knowing that, how far do you want to turn this dial? And they said, well, let's try 80%. And so we did it. We did it, we reported back a plan that was 80% ridership, 20% coverage, cut a lot of unproductive service. The board hearings were exactly as gruesome as I had described. It was absolutely horrible for them. And they ended up at 75. But, they, but in short, they had a conversation in which they were conscious of the fact that they could not do both of those things with the same dollar. And they had to make real choices. That's what elected officials are for. I want to end by talking a little bit about and this may seem like a, 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 a big city, culture, um, coastal elite kind of word, the diversity challenge. What I really mean is this. Um, one of the things that I hear, we hear all the time is people ask me, how do we capture choice writers? And the image of the choice writer is that there's this guy who likes his car, who has his car, and he likes his car, and he drives everywhere in his car. I'm supposed to make him park his car and take the bus instead. Oh, uh, many years ago, when I was presenting a transit plan to the board of a transit agency in suburban Southern California, a board member who represented the wealthiest city in the area <coughs> leaned forward and said, <coughs> now, Mr. Walker, if we adopt this plan of yours, Will that make me leave my BMW in the driveway? And the answer, of course, is no. If you have a BMW, and if your BMW is important enough to you that you needed us all to know that right now, then no, you're going to drive your BMW. But you know, that's fine, because you're a millionaire. There aren't that many of you. I mean, congratulations, I'm sure you worked hard for it. Nobody's questioning you being a millionaire, but there aren't very many of you, and as a result, it would be foolish to design a transit system around your personal tastes, right? This is not how Walmart happened, right? By thinking about the tastes of elites. It would happen by thinking very carefully about the tastes of a kind of lower to middle 70 or 80%. But most of us are in. The problem with the choice rider is that then we, it also gives rise to this, denotion, this notion which you hear of the dependent rider, this person who has to use transit no matter how terrible it is. And when certain transportation engineers get together in dark rooms and they think nobody else is listening, they have an even worse word for these people, they call them captive riders, captive riders like we have them in the dungeon. And that's false too. Um, very few people are actually going to use a service no matter how bad it is. Because the reality is that it's a spectrum. The reality is that everybody is along the spectrum between these comical extremes of, very, of totally choice and totally captive. And we have to remember that, like Walmart, our success is going to lie in grabbing a big chunk of this spectrum 
but not necessarily the part of the spectrum that you personally are on. And so the biggest challenge I have, I have whenever I'm talking to relatively fortunate people, probably includes some of the people in this room, it certainly includes many of the people who will have to sign on and lead any kind of effort to, get a, to, to improve transit in this region, is that this isn't necessarily about you and that your personal tastes are not necessarily a good guide to what will succeed as a transit system. When it happens to me all the time, you know, some very elite person, a billionaire, a tenured professor, someone in a very, in a, in a very comfortable position says, but I wouldn't ride a bus, as though that means we shouldn't have a bus system. Happens all the time. We have to be very gentle with that. We have to generally say, you're not a normal person, you know? <laughs> you're not an average person. Maybe your tastes aren't the things around which the system should be designed. So I think in, in, in wrapping these comments up, I would just want to point out that if transit seems hard, it seems hard because, and the reason transit seems so hard is that we are so trained to expect political issues to be of a, of a win-lose format, that there will be a winner and a loser. This is how we understand sports or elections or war, that it's fundamentally a competition and that you haven't won unless someone else has lost. But transit is a win-win. The entire sustainability of the community, the ability of the community to grow and prosper benefits from a transit system. And what's more, the, right, the, the ridership of a transit system grows based on the diversity of people that you have thought about as you have planned it. So one of the things that happens all the time is I'll get started in a transit planning process and various interest groups will come to the table and they've already drawn their own map of what their transit system would, should be for their interest group. But then we have to put them all together and we have to imagine it from scratch. And in, the, and in the end, the best transit system for all of them doesn't look like what any of them drew. It looks completely different because the key is that we have gotten lots of different kinds of people onto the same vehicle. Remember, the way you get lots of people onto the same vehicle is to get lots of different people onto the same vehicle. Different people doing different things, going different places. So we all have to get out of our bubbles about this, right? Every, every interest group dealing with this has to, has to start with, okay, this is about my people getting on the bus with other people from other interest groups. Yes, that is what transit is. If you don't like that, you probably don't want transit. But fortunately, there are a lot of people who do like that and who are OK with that, because that is how transit succeeds. I think I'll stop there and, um, and ask for any comments or questions at this point. Someone's running around. I had a few more comments. I'll do one more slide. But it gives, gives whoever's, um, Tim, are you there somewhere? Oh, just to get, I'll, while you're getting ready, let me just add a, a little bit of a postscript about sort of what I've been telling um, people here in North Ar Northwest Arkansas about sort of what you would probably need to do to get anywhere with transit. One is that you need to have a regional transit planning process with robust public conversation. When we do these, it's not technical work happening. It's not, oh, the technical people go do their analyses and make their predictions, and then we, f and then we figure out what, whether we like it. It's, it's, no, the public conversation is completely integrated into the planning. The public conversation is, is the plan, and where that conversation leads is ultimately the recommendation, so that it comes out of the community, where all the consultant is doing is guiding it, providing information, providing facts, keeping people in the presence of reality, like those geometric realities, but not, but not saying what it should be. Um, it'll need to focus on the real choices, which are all in some ways tied to interesting questions about who pays. So for example, how much transit? Um, ridership or coverage, you'll have to talk about that. Um, municipal versus regional control. A lot of interesting examples now of regional transit agencies that nevertheless provide a lot of municipal autonomy for, uh, for, for questions that are really internal to a city. The role of technologies. Is technology a tool or a goal? Do you want a rail line, a BRT line, a, 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 um, a maglev, whatever the thing is because you like the thing? Or do you want freedom for the most people? And if you want freedom for the most people, you use the technology as a tool rather than a goal, which means that you 
know what kind of network you want, and oh, given that this is the network, this piece actually looks like it might make sense as BRT or rail or whatever. See the difference? Then you have to fit the plan to the places that value it. It's really, really okay for lots of people to not want transit. In fact, in those places that are just always gonna be unproductive for transit to serve, the places you serve only for coverage reasons, hey, if those don't people, people don't wanna pay for it and don't want it, that can be all the better. You know? um, and finally, you'll have to build that robust coalition, including at least these characters, but probably several others, that would actually form the basis for a sustained campaign to actually get a funding source. So with that, let's uh, have some questions and discussion. Thanks, Tim. Um, this discussion around BRT, whatever transit decisions are made, part of that is the expectation that it's going to impact where people choose to live as they move exactly. into the region, right? Mm -hmm. So with BRT being buses versus some kind of fixed transit, can you, can you comment a little bit about BRT and how it affects development and growth sure. and the permanency of that, I guess? The current, this is something where I think that there's a difference between how architects and developers understand their market and what will actually be logical for people to do when they have the right information. So most people right now do not look at those isochrone diagrams of a place they're considering locating. I think they should be on every real estate listing. Right there. You're gonna live here, there's where you'll be able to get to. Don't, want, don't like that, don't live there, right? Completely make that transparent. I think if that were transparent, the notion that transit will only trigger development if it is fixed infrastructure like rail will dissipate because it doesn't actually make sense. It's one of those things that seems intuitively right and then the more you think about it, the less sense it makes. So the argument for why fixed infrastructure will, um, will support dense development is permanence. The notion that we've put a lot of money in the ground and this thing is physically there and it's not going to move. And the notion that that constitute permanence arises from a basic misunderstanding of transit. Because if you're thinking about buildings or if you're thinking about roads or if you're thinking about water infrastructure, then that's true. Because the cost of, the thing, of that thing is mostly in the physical thing. Transit is not like that. Transit's cost is mostly the cost of operations. And as a result, it is the operations that must eternally make sense if the thing is going to be permanent. One of the most interesting things that from the promoters, particularly of streetcars, is this interesting contradiction in their story because on the one hand, they'll say, well, we need rails because rails generate, per rails generate permanence. And on the other hand, they'll say, you know, they'll tell the story about how the streetcar is a martyr technology. We used to have all these rail lines and evil people destroyed them. And whatever the history is, that kind of proves they weren't permanent, were they, <laughs> you know? So the, the, the permanence you're looking for is the permanence of a market, the permanence of a market for ridership. And that lies in a pattern of land use and the land use and the permanence of the land use is what makes the market permanent. So, you know, um, and, that, and that's the real permanence that matters because it, is, because it is only the permanent source of ridership that gives you the confidence that you'll continue to have the operations, which is the only thing that matters. Otherwise, you just have a cute rail track in your street. Good, great question, common question. Who else, hands up? Let me start walking toward the center, Tim. There you are. You were talking about the uh, increase in freedom, and as you go with increased freedom on the particular line, as the system matures, as the system matures, then obviously, or it seems to be obvious, that it, real estate values, the, the value of that corridor probably would increase as the freedom is, uh, is right. made more available. Uh, as the system matures, have you seen where that diversity is, is uh, you lose that diversity as, it, as freedom increases and property values increase along a, a line. And, the, you know, how does, how do you, how does the system mature 
as time goes on, I guess, is you know, one of the things, what well, seems to be one of the challenges for transits, because uh, uh, you're talking about coverage. Mm -hmm. It's also coverage you know, from an economic standpoint as a quarter matures and right. freedom becomes more prevalent that it becomes more desirable and obviously mm -hmm. property values increase and pushes out a lot of the diversity and a lot of the, the choice and coverage that you were looking for. Right. So you're raising this whole set of issues around gentrification and around what we call the suburbanization of poverty, uh, the tendency for um, now that dense and walkable places are cool, we're pushing lower income people out of them, which is making, and if you force lower income people to be in places where they have to own cars, you've made them poorer, right? Because being able to sell a car, being able to share a car within a couple or within a family is a great way to be wealthier very easily because, when, because having cars is so expensive. One of the th reasons I talk so much about frequent buses, including in big cities where lots of people tend to be wanting to talk only about streetcars, is that unlike higher order, more expensive kinds of transit, buses can go everywhere in much greater quantity. Right? And that's why I feel pretty sure for this community that your starting transit investment is probably not a rail line. Your starting transit investment is probably a better bus system, which then grows and the, and, the, and you know you have a case for a rail line when the buses are starting to get full. And then the, you know, the higher order uh, technologies arise out of you know, the, fa the fact that you've started to build a market with buses. But, um, but I think your point about, about being pushed into coverage by the fact that lower income people are being pushed into places that are not dense, walkable, or linear, and therefore where we can't really get to them, goes to the fact that low-income people need better information about the consequences of their location choice, right? Low-income people make location choices too. Plenty of them, you know, have a motorcycle and that's all they need and that's fine. They, shouldn't, they don't need to live on a transit line. But plenty of them would use transit if they were close to it. And so that information is so fundamental. That's why I think, you know, that just having those isochrones, those blobs, that, that image in every real estate listing would change how a lot of people on diff various different parts of the income spectrum would, would make those location choices. A good thing to remember, by the way, is a lot of people are going to come at this thinking that their transit service is somehow an expression of the government's judgment about who they are. And they will come and tell us their personal stories as though that will make us care about them more. And the message I'm giving you, and the message you will all have to become versatile in sharing, is that your transit service is not about who you are, but it is about where you are. Their transit cannot help but be overwhelmingly focused on certain kinds of geography and not others. That's just what it is. Uh, Jared, uh, earlier today, we uh, met with uh, Ozark Regional Transit, uh, Razorback Transit, U of A, and uh, we talked a lot about uh, fast-growing regions and how they've approached mm -hmm. this subject. One of your recommendations was in there about having a, a larger policy discussion. You shared with something uh, with us earlier that uh, ULI actually generated a, a lot of the initial discussion in Wake County, Raleigh. Is that correct? Could you, right. Could you share a little more about that? One of the great things about these kinds of initiatives, we've been through several that have led to successful votes. Um, there were a whole, you may have, I don't know if you missed, noticed this in the midst of the larger news, but the last November's election produced a practically sweet, clean sweep across the nation of local ballot measures for new funding sources for transit. They won almost everywhere. Uh, and two of them that won, Indianapolis and Raleigh, Wake County, North Carolina, we were, we were highly involved in. Um, it's interesting how the, co the coalition starts from different places. The energy comes from different places in different communities and then gradually grows and becomes broader. So uh, in, in Wake County, the spark perhaps some of the, of the function being provided by the Walton Family Foundation in bringing us here, was actually coming from the real estate industry, from the Urban Land Institute, which is a major national body for, for real estate and development. And when I first visited there and did, did events very, like, very much like this one, 
I, was in, I, was, I basically was in rooms full of developers who were the people who really wanted a better transit system so that they could build a denser city because they all wanted that and they felt like the local market wanted that. Um, other cities have started from different places. But so you, so you know, the consensus can start from anywhere and build outward from anywhere, but it is important to remember that in a place that is growing this fast, there are enormous consequences to whether more of that growth happens in the form of density uh, in, around transit-friendly corridors as opposed to you know, sprawl out over the, you know, spreading out over the landscape. And that there are lots of different interests and lots of different perspectives on that that can be brought together into, you know, into coming up with a robust transit plan that lots of people can be excited by. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Well, I'd uh, like to thank Jarrett Walker. I've asked him about 50 questions uh, uh, about transit, and especially rapidly growing regions. Uh, one of the things that always uh, strikes me about Northwest Arkansas, we don't have one large central city. The largest city, uh, Fayetteville, Arkansas, represents about 17.5% of the population. So once again, everything we try to do on a regional basis really takes everybody uh, up and down the corridor to make it happen. I've quizzed Mr. Walker about this uh, quite a bit today as, as we talk about uh, improving our transit. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Adam Waddell and Gary Smith with Razorback Transit for their time this afternoon or this morning and uh, Joel Gardner and his staff uh, this afternoon. Um, just to share with you, uh, our current system with uh, Ozark Regional Transit is only weekday service, Monday through Friday. We don't currently provide uh, weekend service uh, within the corridor. Uh, Razorback Transit does provide some limited uh, service uh, on the uh, weekends. Uh, we have a long way to go as a region as the Northwest Arkansas Regional Planning Commission, we do have uh, funds programmed to do a transit development plan update from the 2010 plan. We've had a lot of discussion uh, this afternoon and this morning about what that may look like from a regional perspective. Uh, I found it really interesting the last uh, two months of discussion as you hear about uh, Amazon and looking for a new uh, region to locate in and their desire to have transit. Uh, not that we're trying to attract Amazon here, but as a region that may be over 800,000 people in a fairly short period of time, uh, it's something that we really need to focus on of how to uh, plan for and uh, pay for that transit. Just one other fact, and those who are from cities here tonight, uh, Ozark Regional Transit, uh, their current funding is uh, some federal and then local funding. So uh, every budget season, and I know there's several budget meetings going on uh, this evening at several city councils, but every budget season, uh, for Joel just to fund his system, he has to have an appropriation typically through a general fund. Um, the region receives around 2.6 a million dollars in federal funds uh, for transit and we uh, split that between the two systems with uh, uh, University of Arkansas Razorback Transit and ORT. Um, so we're, uh, as I asked Jared, I said I feel like we're uh, sometimes crawling, sitting up, and not really running. Uh, your response to me was, well, <laughs> start where you are. Start, start where we're at. And uh, uh, so we look forward to uh, hopefully uh, having some really great additional events. The next speaker is Jeff Speck, author of Walkable City. We don't have a date set for that. Uh, we're still working for or looking for the uh, third speaker. And then the fourth event will be uh, we'll be bringing in some pair cities to have a discussion with Ozark Regional Transit and Razorback Transit on how to improve mobility within the region. So once again, I'd like to thank Mr. Walker uh, for his time uh, this evening. Uh, we really appreciate uh, everything you shared with us and your uh, expertise. And then I'd like to thank 
all the individuals here that may be from a planning commission, city council, uh, uh, state DOT is here, RDOT, uh, so, and our commissioner, uh, of the uh, chairman of the uh, highway commission is here. So uh, once again, we really, uh, in Northwest Arkansas, we always have a really great turnout and everybody does try to really work together to improve mobility in our transportation systems in Northwest Arkansas. So thank you again. Uh, don't forget to fill out the survey about this event tonight that's on the table. And then also if you'd like to help the highway department uh, with your opinion on uh, needs for uh, RDOT and the highway commission, uh, please fill out that survey uh, this evening. And Commissioner Trammell, did you? Uh, no, okay. So thank you again, appreciate it.